Tonight's an interesting night. I'm not one who normally jumps on numbers, but numbers do mean something in the Bible. And there are all kinds of significant numbers. Three is a significant number. Seven is a significant number. Twelve is a significant number. There's a number 30. 30 is a very significant number. 30 is the age that Jesus was when he began his ministry. 30 is the age also we see when God raised up Jacob. 30 is the age we see throughout the Bible time and again when God would use people at the age of 30. David was 30 when he became king. 30 is a number of preparation. You weren't allowed to be a priest. You were not fully ordained as a priesthood until you were 30 years of age. There's a couple reasons for that, because men are strange. They say that men have five fundamental changes in their life, the way that they think. They radically change the way they think and how they process information. They change that around 17, 18 years old, change it again around 20. I remember when you were 17, those you guys, and then when you turned 20, you thought a little bit different when you were at 20. The priorities started changing from 17. Changes again around 22, 23. It changes final time around 25, 26, or fourth time. And then the final change is around age 30, where you finally settled down to your way of thinking for life. I also believe that's why 95% of the people that get saved get saved before the age of 25. Because once they cross that age, they have settled down to the way that they're thinking for the rest of their lives. But God also, in preparing people to be used by Him, wanted them to get through a process where they finally settled down. <laughs> How do you know when you're a young Christian, there are a lot of swings you have? When I first got saved, man, there was joy unspeakable and full of glory. I mean, it was awesome. It was glorious. It was wonderful. And I mean, 30 minutes later, I could be in deep depression. <laughs> Am I talking to anybody here? Anybody relate? Come on. It's just like, oh, life is terrible. Oh, am I ever going to make it? And, you know, and then God touched you with a little touch and all one little scripture. And you're like, woo, back on top again, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and those of us who've helped disciple people, everybody say the word disciple. That word, when we, those of us that help disciple people, we understand you have to learn quickly to have patience with the process. Because baby Christians are babies. One moment they're cooing and giggling, the next moment they're pooping, pooping and crying. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a time and a process that we grow through that. But then there comes that time when God says, now you have gone through the process of maturity and now you are ready to really step in to your anointing. And I've seen so many Christians, less Holy Ghost, I've seen so many Christians fail to get to the age of 30 in the spirit. I don't mean you have to be saved for 30 years. Don't get me wrong. But you have to reach the place of maturity. Ever say maturity. maturity. The place of maturity where you're able, where God can say you've settled down enough, you've gone through enough, you're stable enough. I can trust you to move forward with stability in the work that I've called you to do. Amen. As long as you're, oh Lord, I'm going to get in trouble. As long as you're an emotional yo-yo, God still loves you. We still love you. <laughs> Come on. This is like Joel Osteen. We still love you. <laughs> you know, I was listening to him the other day. I'm telling you, how can you not listen to that guy and feel good? I mean, I mean, I, I mean you listen to the guy, you feel good, okay? I'm sitting there going, wow, you know, I might not get saved, but I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
But <laughs> I'm in so much trouble. But, but it, God wants us to arrive to a place of maturity. I want you to open your Bibles. Anywhere is fine. It's all anointed. To the book of Galatians chapter 4. And then I want to dive into a few things. And you say, well, where are you going with this number 30? I'll tell you in a few moments. There is a significance to the number 30. And for those of you that are wondering, no, we're not in Egypt. This is not the plague of the locusts that is flying around the room tonight. I was going to... Will somebody get that thing? There you go. I was going to hit my Bible, but I didn't want to because I don't want to wipe that thing off my Bible. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Father, we give you praise. <laughs> now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. I want to stop right there for a few moments. Because we have a covenant with God. Oh, I'm going to say that again. We have a covenant with God. Amen. We have covenant promises. We have covenant rights. We have covenant authority. We are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Which means everything that he owns, we own. Am I in a Baptist church here tonight? Let me try that again. Everything he owns, we own. Maybe you need to understand what he owns. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all whom dwell within. He owns it all. We own it all. No, 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 you got to get a hold. We as the children of God have the legal right to every resource, to every financial wealth, to everything that's here on the earth. It legally belongs to God. Therefore, it legally belongs to us. Huh? Don't get all fresh, fussy and y'all upset. These, 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 this demon spirit that's going through Wall Street, trying to, this protest Wall Street and, you know, try to tear down the rich. That's things being led by a demon spirit that's been running throughout Europe. The same spirit that's been trying to overthrow the governments in, 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 in all throughout the Middle East. It's the same spirit trying to come here to America. But I got news. The devil might have succeeded over there, but he's not going to succeed over here. What are y'all getting about? Well, all those rich people, they got all my money. Well, listen, the Bible says that God uses the rich to toil, to gather the wealth, but they're not going to eat it. It's laid up for the righteous. So don't get upset when they start gathering money. They're just doing the hard work for us. Yeah. 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 Huh? Come on, huh? And we need, we need to learn to step in to the, to the covenant promise of God and the revelation. It belongs to us for the purpose of the kingdom. I remember driving down the street one time. I saw a big old Bill, Budweiser billboard. I started prophesying, Budweiser, you're going to give me $3 million. You say, why would they give you $3 million? I don't know. I don't care. Why would some racetrack owner give Oral Roberts $1.6 million? I don't know, and I don't care. There was a man uh, uh, down in Africa, <laughs> and he, he was a driver for a preacher. And this preacher, they were heading on down to the meeting, and this preacher was going with Morris Thriller for the very first time. And he was to teach on finances, and... Uh, he was going there for the very first time, and they go going down, go, had to go through the main part of the city to get to the meeting. And it's a big hill going through the city down. And he's going down, and he's going faster and faster and faster. 
And the preacher turns to his man and says, hey, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. He said, no slow down. No brakes. Just play in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so here he's going down. And he's like, what do you mean? Just play, play. I do it every day. Don't worry. <laughs> And the, and the lights red, the traffic's going this way. See, I told you it works every day. Of course, the preacher's like sweating bullets. He's, he's praying in his spirit now. So he gets, he gets to the meeting. He gets to the meeting. He stands up there, more shrillish preaching, and people are shouting, up, and they're you're screaming and crying out to God. And he's like, oh, Lord, I can't preach in this conference. I can't follow this guy. Oh, look at the, look at the breakthrough they're getting. I just got my little notes. Then he looks over, and there's another person. They're going to have three preachers in the morning. There's another person. He's an old man. He thought, okay, good. The old man goes before me, so I'll do all right after the old man. Well, the old man gets up there. Gentleman, he's gone to be with the Lord by the name of Paul Cherline. He starts preaching on my body, his life, on the revelation of the Christ life. Oh, man, the place is going crazy. And he's like, how am I going to follow this guy? So then he gets up there and he starts, has them open their Bibles, starts preaching. He said, everybody pulls out their notepads and pulls out their Bibles and starts taking notes. And, and it's, it's just like quiet Bible study. And he goes back to his hotel room. It's like, Lord God, I just need to leave. I need to get on a plane and go to home tomorrow because I just need to leave. In the middle of the night, a bright white light appeared in his room. And God spoke to him in an audible voice. And began to download revelation on biblical finances. Said, you go into that room and you have to understand, Dr. Cirillo had given an instruction. He's very, he's very sensitive to the spirit. He'd given him instru all the preacher's instruction. Nobody is to take an offering until I say so. Well, God speaking to him in an audible voice, bright light, white, white light in his room. And God said, after you deliver this word, and then you take an offering. And he said, but God, you told Dr. Cirillo, Dr. Cirillo said nobody take it. He said, I'll take care of Dr. Cirillo. <laughs> so he gets, he gets down, next meeting, of course, they're going to, no breaks, no breaks. He's not worried. He said, I saw a light last night, all right. We're going to make it through this one fine. Amen, yeah. <laughs> so they get down. <laughs> so... <laughs> So they get to the meeting, and it's time for him to preach, and everybody pulls out their notepads and their Bibles like they're ready. He, started, he said, last night, God spoke to me in an audible voice. He said the Bibles and the notepads dropped on the floor. They were on the edge of their seats. He delivered the word, and, he said, and then he said, God told me we're to take an offering this morning. And he said it, and then he looked over at Dr. Srillo, and Dr. Srillo just leaned over those beady little eyes and said, John. If God told you to take an offering, take it! <laughs> <laughs> so he goes and he starts taking the offering. And as he's taking it, he starts to, he takes the offering. People start giving and giving and giving. He says, I'm going to pray a breakthrough prayer. People are giving. He said it was huge offering. People, the buckets are overflowing as people are giving tremendously. He gets up there. It takes about 15 minutes to get because people are giving so strong. He said, all right, I'm ready to pray. He stood up. He said, he stood, started to pray. As soon as he opened about to start praying, someone shout out, wait a minute. Hold on, Brother John. I did not do what God told me to do. Don't pray. So this man comes running out. Someone else shouts out. And there's thousands of people. Wait a minute. I did not do what I should have done. Hold on. So now another one runs out. Now another one runs out. This starts going on for about a, another 15 minutes. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Finally, after now it's 30 minutes. He said, all right, you need to stop. Just we're done. Stop giving. I'm going to pray. Brother John, wait a minute. <laughs> they keep coming. They keep coming. Others that already come twice, they're coming again. He commands them a second time. Stop. Stop giving. They wouldn't stop. He commanded them a third time, stop giving. They wouldn't stop. He said people were standing up in the balcony, throwing offerings down. Make sure it gets up there. Someone pick it up. <laughs> For 45 minutes. Hello. Come on, we get upset when an offering goes more than 45 seconds. 
Boy, it's quiet now. I know, I know the way Americans think. Uh oh. Did you see a secret offering envelope tonight? I know there's got to be a special offering. He's talking about money. Oh, y'all didn't get that one. All right. So 45 minutes goes on. The, his driver takes him home. The next day, his driver shows up in a brand new Mercedes. He said, where has this car been the whole time? <laughs> he said, Brother John, you don't understand. Last night, yesterday, when you took the offering, God told me to give every penny I had. I emptied my wallets. I gave everything else I had. I had no money. I got a call from my aunt. She likes me. My uncle, he hates me. He's not a believer. My aunt called me up and said, come over for dinner tonight. So I came over and I had dinner. And then I'm leaving out of dinner to get in my car. And my uncle turns to me and he says, you know I don't like you. He says, yes, I know, but I still pray for you. You know I don't, I don't, don't pray for me. I don't like, I don't like your Christianity. You know I don't like you. Yes, I know you like you. So I don't understand why I'm doing this. But you see my brand new Mercedes? I, I, you know I don't like you, right? Yes. I have to give you my Mercedes. Now, get in the car and go away because you know I don't like you. Huh? She caught on my Sunday. Hallelujah. You know, I, I tell you, if you're going to be a covenant receiver, you're going to have to get rid of some of your southern niceties. Oh, no, no, no. I couldn't possibly accept it. Yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, he come on. Hello. Don't turn it down. Take it. Right. Take it by force. Say, say this thing. He reached out the key. Say, you, thank you. It's mine. I receive it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Okay, y'all looking at me strange. That's all right. Huh? Come on, don't you think it's time we begin to move into a whole other dimension of expectation? I said, don't you think it's time we move into a whole other dimension of expectation? Huh? We begin to look beyond the natural into the realm of the supernatural. We stop being limited by the what we can produce. God never called you to do what you could do, because if you could do it, you would get all the glory. Oh... So he's always calling you to do that which you cannot do. So when he does it through you, then only he can get the glory. Because you're going to sit back and everybody will sit back and say, look what the Lord has done. Somebody say, we're heirs. Say it again, say, we're heirs. So what's the problem in America? Why aren't we seeing this? Why aren't we seeing the power of the inheritance? Let's go back to Galatians 4. Verse 1, you knew I had to throw a zinger. I got you all encouraged. <laughs> now, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. See, the Jewish heir... He had the right to the inheritance, but as long as he was a child, he was raised side by side with the slave children. They had their needs met. They received education. Are you all hearing me? Yes. Had the food, had clothing, received education. But it wasn't until, someone say until, it wasn't until he became a son that he had the right to use and access the inheritance. As long as he was a child, he had his needs met. But when he became a son, he could access the inheritance. Hmm. 
Romans chapter 8. Let's go there for a moment. Lord Jesus. Shakaran, my Sunday. <laughs> Let's begin with verse 12 for a moment. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Watch this next verse. Here's the home run. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. <laughs> For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by, oh my God, huh. You got to understand that adoption. That adoption is, you know, that was what was considered. The, the child of the heir was considered a child, but when he was bar mitzvahed, he, there was actually a process in parts of the Jewish culture where he was adopted, even though he's natural born, he was an adopted son now. Yep. Yeah. He moved from childhood to manhood. He moved from childhood to sonship. And when he received, he became a, a son. He cried out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He hath then children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Someone say joint heirs. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified with him. When we hit the age that we finally grow up, how do we know we grow up? Because by the power of the Spirit of God, we mortify the deeds of the flesh. Yeah. When we finally get control of the flesh, when we finally settle down, oh my Father God, when we finally settle down, oh, y'all hear me, when we finally grow to an age of significant maturity that we stop vacillating back and forth, God says now you're ready to receive the sonship, you're ready to receive the right to begin to access the inheritance. But instead in the body of Christ today in America, it's a strategy of the enemy. He's not been able to stop you from getting born again, but he stopped many of us from growing up. I'm going to say that again. He's not been able to get many of you from to stop from being born again, but he did get us to stop from growing up. So the church, I won't get in trouble right now. So the church is full, full of a bunch of nipple sucking babies. Huh? That want to whine and complain about every little thing. They have little temper tantrums, throw themselves on the floor because they didn't get their way. Oh, my Lord. You say, what's the difference? To <laughs> See, a child will scream and holler and beg and plead and manipulate to get his way. A father will sacrifice to make sure others get what they need. Uh, one that grows up. See, my kids, when they were little, it was all right for them to sit there and, you know, that they, they, they did what babies did. They cried when they first, you know, got, you know, they were hungry or wanted to be changed or wanted attention. They cried and you try to figure it out. It was always fun with Benjamin and Josiah because Benjamin started talking at a young age and Josiah would make noise and Benjamin would interpret Andrew would tell us, Josiah wants this, and Josiah wants that, and Josiah wants this. So Josiah didn't even talk. He was too, too something. He wasn't even talking. Why do I need to talk? Benjamin is interpreting for me. <laughs> it wasn't until Benjamin went to preschool that Josiah decided, oh, I can talk, and he hadn't stopped since. <laughs> <clears throat> expect them I expect them to do that daddy I'm hungry mommy I'm hungry I want this I want that but as they grow up I change my expectation level my love has not changed but my expectation of them has changed when they're three I'm we're gonna make the food for them when they're 10, 11, and 12, we start teaching them how to make the food for themselves. 
Now that Benjamin's 19, Dad, give me a sandwich. I said, you get your own sandwich and make me one too. That was about when he was 14. Now that he's 19, go get a job. Go buy me some food. I tell you, there's no greater thrill when your son can afford to take you out. Now, it still might be McDonald's, but it is taking you out. Huh? And when you see the joy in his heart of the being able to take the responsibility and say, you know what? I earned this money, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to be the generous one. I'm going to be the one. And what does that make me want to do as a father that makes me want to entrust him with more authority? Come on. Because he grew up. But we got a lot of people in the church that never want to grow up. That's why, that's why, oh, I'm going to get in trouble right now. That's why we got so many people that say, well, I love God, but they can't get in church. Well, the church is full of hypocrites. Yeah, you were one of them. Uh, come on. Of course the church is full of hypocrites. Where else are they going to get saved and sanctified and set free? You're not perfect. They're not perfect. Pray for them instead of criticizing them. But instead, we spend so much of our time whining about this one hurt me and that one disappointed me and this one said this. That's because you're still little children fighting on a schoolyard. Oh, I'm in so much trouble. And God's saying, I've got weapons of warfare and I've got gifts and I've got blessings and I've got authority and I've got kingdom dominion and I can't trust it with hardly anybody because they're too busy being children playing schoolyard games. Turn to your neighbor and say, is he talking about you? No, no. Uh. Watch this. Let's go back to Galatians. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 4. Shoo. It's time we grow up. It's time we get over ourselves. It's time we get over all the disappointments. It's time we stop going to church only for ourselves. What do I get out? Well, I got to get my blessing. See, that's why God's speaking to us as a church. Even as a church, as much as God's been moving here and as far as we've been going, God's been speaking, he's speaking to us as a church, and he wants a church that's going to grow up. And he told me, listen, there is nothing wrong with coming before God to receive your needs. Don't ever think, don't ever let anybody diminish that. That is powerful and important, but that is not where you're to only live. The, one of the signs of maturity is when you learn to start coming before God solely for the purpose of glorifying him. Oh, huh? I'm coming not for what I can get out of it. I'm coming for what God's going to get out of it. I'm coming to bless. I'm coming to give. I'm coming to worship. I'm coming to honor. I'm coming. And the Lord spoke to us Saturday night. He said, he, and he told me, he said, there's nothing wrong. He said, I, you need to have it. I want you to have services on Sundays, services that minister to people and get them healed and delivered and filled up in revelation and touches and times we can share with each other. They come to me and I come to them and it's great. He said, but will you give me a service? That the whole focus is about me. That it's not about the people. It's not about them getting their needs. It's about my people learning how to be kings and priests unto me. How to be priests unto me. Oh, and come and minister unto me. And they come to me to have the revelation of me. Are y'all hearing me? They come to worship me. They come to glorify me. They come to magnify me. They come to honor me. They don't come for what they need. They only come for me. And I thought, Lord, no one will come. Hardly anybody will come. The Lord said, don't be afraid. He said, don't be afraid. I said, yes, sir. But I felt a fear of God on this one. 
And my mind and heart raced through, and I said, I don't hardly know a place, a church of any significant size that would even dare to take one of their weekend services and even risk not because even when I mentioned it there were some visitors that got up and walked out because when I told them we weren't going to pray for their needs that's what they came for their needs because they don't there's I love them love I love them but they're still children now, we all have needs. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. We all have needs. There's nothing childish about coming to God to get your needs. But when that's the only reason we come. That's why you got a lot of people that only go to church once every three, four weeks. Because they only come to church when they got to get something. As long as they're feeling all right, as long as the money's coming in, then they're out there at the lake, and then they're out there doing, uh, the, oh, my Lord Jesus, come on, they're out there doing the sporting events and everything. But when trouble comes along, man, oh, preacher, I need some prayer. Oh, I need to get in church. I need a touch from God. Well, how many, when was the last time we cried out from our heart? Man, I can't wait to go to church. I can't wait to go to church so I can touch the heart of God. I'm not coming to get, I'm coming to empty out. It's a sign we're growing up. It's a sign when your children are growing up that they stop coming to you. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You still got 35-year-old children? Come on, somebody, amen. They keep coming. I know, I know. I met 50 year old children. They keep coming and coming and coming. No, no, it's a sign they grow up when they say, you know what? I'm not coming to you to what you can give to me. I'm coming to you for what I can give to you. I'm growing up. Uh -huh. Watch this. For verse 1 again, Galatians chapter 4. Now, now, listen, I'm not trying to beat anybody up because we're all children at some time. Come on, somebody, amen. And it's all right to go through your childhood. Just don't, just don't stay there. Now, I want to talk for a moment while we're there and, and, and show you something. But watch this. Watch this. <clears throat> Verse 1 and then 2. Now, I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ from a slave, though he is master of all. Watch this. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. This is a principle. Everybody say a principle. Because the context here was dealing with the law and grace. But there's an underlying principle that they practiced in their culture that we can learn from the principle. And that is this. Until they, they were under governors, which are authorities, and stewards, people that were responsible for them, until they grew up and could start being responsible for others. Let me rephrase it. Well, okay. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 28 for a moment. Let me pull this all together. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Are you getting something tonight? Ah, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 18. <clears throat> And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Who has all authority? Who has all authority? We are joint heirs with, with Christ. But as long as we're children, we can't access that inheritance. And part of that inheritance is the authority. Oh, my Lord. See, we keep telling baby Christians... You have all authority. You have all authority. I've never seen one baby Christian that walks in all authority. Come on, amen. No, they don't have all authority. They have authority to bind the devil from attacking them. He shall by no means harm you, but you don't have all authority. Jesus has all authority, and he only begins to share dimension to that authority in direct relation to the level of our, of our growth, our maturity. So watch what he ties together here. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore, because I have authority. 
Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Go over to Matthew 18. Oh, Rama Sunday. Actually, let's do 16. Let's do 16, verse, verse, verse 17. <laughs> or verse 18. 16, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you all authority. I'll give, come on, I'll give the keys, the one that has right of access to everything that is in the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. No, no, that's not what it means. You know, in the Amplified, can we put verse 18 up on the Amplified? You have got to see, or 19, verse 19 in the Amplified. This is so, this will fry your socks off. Come on, can we get that up there for in the Amplified? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven. See, I have all authority. I've, the kingdom principles have been established in heaven, and I'm going to give you the access to that authority that you can take what is already legal in heaven and make it legal on earth and you can take what is illegal in heaven and you will have the power to make it illegal on the earth. Yeah. Sickness is illegal in heaven. I'll give you the power to make it illegal on the earth. Poverty is illegal in heaven. I'll give you the power to make it illegal on the earth. Come on. Depression is illegal in heaven. I'll give you the power to make it illegal on the earth. Huh? Peace is legal in heaven. I'll give you the power to make it legal on the earth. Oh my, everything that is legal, I'll give you the authority, the legal right to exercise that power here on the earth. And everything that is illegal, I'll give you authority, the legal right to make it, to stop it here on the earth. Okay? Someone say it's ours. But not so quickly. Let's go back to Matthew 28. All authority has been given to me. Now, I told you already that I was going to give it to you. It's been given to me. My plan is to get it to you. Now, I'm going to tell you how you can get to the place where you access the authority I have. Go ye therefore and make Disciple, my father, God, that word disciples <laughs> literally means a disciplined follower. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all things things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always if you teach them to begin to obey what I do and to obey and you disciple them that they become disciplined followers of me obeying everything that I commanded you then I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven I will give you the right to exercise the power and authority here on the earth yeah. Huh? But what are we doing in the church in America? We're not making disciples. We're making a bunch of wishy-washy, half-baked converts. Huh? I'm going to kill that thing. Did it finally die? You got it good. Crush it with the sheer force of the power of your hand oh, over her head. Every say, go make disciples. It's every one of our jobs. Watch this. Let's go back. To, let's go back to Galatians 4. Are y'all getting this? Shut up on Sunday. Are you enjoying this, Mike? Are you, are you getting some uh, discipleship right now? All right. I, I won't explain why he's getting it, but he's getting it. Galatians. 
chapter 4, verse 2. You're an heir. You don't differ anything from a child. But you're under guardians and stewards. Can we see what that looks like in the Amplified? I don't even have that <clears throat> right here. Galatians. But is under guardians and administrators or trustees. You're not going to get there until you get under the authority of somebody Come on, Come on. who has the responsibility to train you up in maturity. Get under mentors. Get under authorities. I believe one of the reasons and the purposes of the local church, not that they've been doing this, because they haven't, a lot of them. Some have, thank God for them. But a lot of local churches are just a gathering of crowds. But the purpose is to establish an environment of authority, of teaching, of instruction, of correction, of adjustments. Adjustments. I'm going to come in for a landing here in a minute. Everybody say adjustments. adjustments. Anybody ever go to a chiropractor? Oh, yeah. Ever have an adjustment that didn't feel so good? Yeah. I had one this morning. She hit me and I went, Aah! She said, that sounded like something coming out. <laughs> I needed it. I call it a whack and a crack. We don't like adjustments. Because we want in the church, we have a concept that the purpose of the church and the purpose of our Christian relationships is supposed to be all this lovey-dovey, fluffy-fluffy, everything's okay, no, oh, it's all right, God loves you. It's a, it don't matter. Just leave me alone. They tell you now in church. They say, you want to have a big church? You got to make it all positive. Don't demand the people to do anything. Tell them how they can succeed, but don't, 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 don't make, if you make an adjustment, you got to make it so minor and so soft because you don't want to offend. All right. Maybe people are getting saved. They have big pacifier services. Everybody with their little binky. You know your kid has that binky too long when they learn how to stick it halfway out and start spinning it in circles and doing tricks with it? That was Benjamin. He was good, man. He do twirls with that thing. He was like, all right, uh, you're done with the minky. <laughs> we are to be disciple. And how is the process of discipleship? We are to be trained in righteousness. We are to be instructed in obedience and taught how to obey. Ever say how to obey? Benjamin, if you'll come. We're taught how to obey. And then, here's the second part. Not only are we to be discipled, we are all, ever say all, all. we are all required to disciple. So I have a, do not answer, do not raise your hand. Don't pass go, don't collect $200, just listen. How many people are you discipled? I mean, really actively, see, discipleship isn't an accident. Discipleship isn't, discipleship isn't just being there as an encourager. Discipleship is a relationship and a commitment that I'm going to teach someone the principles of God. 
I'm going to hold them accountable. I'm going to wipe up the messes when they make a mess. I'm going to love them when they blow it. Come on. I'm not going to let them get away with it. I'm going to, but I'm going to encourage them. Come on, amen. And I'm going to keep bringing them back to the Word of God. Now, because we've lacked so much of the body of Christ this, I was sitting down with a man. Man, they're all over the place today. I was sitting down with a man today from India. Pastor, he's got 107 churches in India. And we were talking. He was being introduced to me. Precious man. Has a Bible, Bible school and he's trained up. And I said, well, what do you teach them? One's for a year, one's for two years. And he said some basic doctrine, this and that, mainly evangelism. Now, it's an interesting thing. I saw a little video, a DVD thing with a bunch of pictures on it. And I looked in these eyes. Guys, please hear me. I looked in the eyes of these Bible college students. And I knew before I ever met this man. I said, they don't know enough yet. I could see that they didn't have spiritual breakthroughs. I could see that they didn't have the level of understanding they needed to have to face the battles they were going to face in India. At the end of the conversation, the pastor revealed to me that most of the disciples he raised up, he raises them up, they buy him a bicycle, buy him a big bullhorn, and send them out to do ministry, and most of them, he said, backslide. After investing all that time. And I, I thought to myself, Self? <laughs> Thought to myself, <laughs> they need my discipleship course. Not that ours is the only thing. There's wonderful courses out there, but don't get me wrong. But this is the one that I have, that I ha we have access to. And I thought to myself, I was like, they need more scripture. They need more revelation. They need more experience. They need more breakthrough. They need a higher level of discipleship. They need people that can love on them, but also people that can point them. You may not know all the word in your heart yourself, but you can get a hold of it and you can walk through with people. I begin to lay this as a foundation because there is a shift happening in the body of Christ. There's going to be those that want to go on and have big church and play church. And then there's God is going to be raising up people all throughout this nation that are going to be after not simply getting souls saved, not simply getting converts, but making the commitment, I'm going to get them saved and I'm going to get them discipled. I'm going to get them saved and I'm going to get them discipled. And let me tell you something, no greater joy I think you'll have in your life outside of your personal relationship with God than when you begin to pour into somebody and they get discipled and then you watch them go out and get other people saved and start discipling them. Oh my, you begin to wonder, you, you'll stop wondering what is my purpose and what is my call, what is my role. You begin to see that you start having spiritual sons and spiritual daughters, glory be to God, and you'll realize the more you disciple them, the, you're actually getting more out of it than even they're getting out of it. You're getting the breakthroughs. You're growing up. You're maturing. You know why? Because you realize, hey, I can't teach this stuff and not live it. I got, it's time for me to grow up. It's time for me to stop being a spiritual child in the body of Christ, mainly coming for what I get. It's time for me to be a spiritual son or daughter and me to begin to give more than I get from church. Jesus. That's not putting guilt on anybody. That's not putting guilt or shame on anybody. If you're sitting there saying, well, I just don't know much, Brother Steve. Well, let me tell you something. You can go right onto the church website, go on a got discipleship course. Every, if there are 30-minute video programs. There's, audio, there's written and there's audio also. Begin to make a commitment to begin to study. I'm telling you, it'll start changing your life. Come on, amen.
I mean, we've got, we've got season, season men of God sitting right here on the third row, been all over the world doing incredible things around the world. They're going through the course. They've been coming to me. They, they, they talk to each other. Man, did you get to lesson 14? Wow. You know, what a breakthrough. Oh, did you get to this? They're, they're getting, oh, you guys get, you guys are getting stuff out of it. They're getting breakthroughs out of it. And now they come to me and we're going to be doing the 20,000 souls. And it, we, we, we quickly came to realization. It's not about 20,000 souls getting saved. It's about 20,000 disciples. Come on, amen. And I'm telling you, something about this is resonating inside of the hearts and the spirits of people. The pastors are beginning to line up. I didn't tell you this in the last, t today alone, I talked to a major significant pastor in Houston. He said, I want you to do it down here in Houston. I talked to a major significant pastor who's got a television net station, his own station, just got it six months ago in the San Francisco Bay Area. He called me up today. He said, I want your Ted's Discipleship TV program. I want to start broadcasting it for free. Are y'all hearing me? My God. And then he said, as soon as you get the 20,000 souls up and running there in Dallas, I want you to bring it here to the Bay Area. Glory be to God. Huh? But it's going to require a people who say, you know what? I'm not going to sit on the sidelines anymore. I'm not just going to be a child of God anymore. I want to be a son and daughter. I want to access the inheritance. And I'm going to begin to be discipled. And I'm going to start discipling in the name of Jesus. Because discipleship is the key to the inheritance. Oh, come on. Come on. Did you see it? That was Jesus' final instruction. Go.